Hello. Right. Wow, that light is really bright. Magento, the App Store, and the Play Store. Three things rarely spoken about in the same sentence. But then a client of ours came to us and said, you've already built this responsive website for us. We've got month on month growth. Can we take a small piece of it and package it inside a native app on both iOS and Android? And that was, it kind of took us by surprise because we're a Magento agency, which means we've got PHP devs, sorry, and JavaScript developers. So we were thinking, well, where does that leave us with this request? What are the required skill sets to build a native app on these platforms? First, you're going to need some design and user experience. Well, we have that in-house, so we get a green tick for that one. No problem. Next, you're going to need API development. Because in the apps, even when they've got many offline features, they tend to be API driven, especially if you want to start giving sign in and catalog browsing, short buy in, and everything else. Now, we're in a Magento agency, so APIs are kind of our bread and butter, so that was not a problem. And that just leaves us with the big one, like actually building the app. And we kind of felt a bit like that. <laughs> so, what do we do? Do we go ahead and learn languages like Objective-C or Swift to get on iOS? And at the same time, learn something like Java or Kotlin, which looks amazing, by the way, to get on the Play Store? Now, this didn't seem like a great idea to us. I don't know about you, but I definitely don't want to learn a new programming language every, every time a new project comes along. But there was also another thing that kind of rubbed us up the wrong way. We are web developers. So we write code bases that run everywhere. That's kind of the beauty of the web. So this idea of building once for iOS and then rebuilding in a different language, a different platform, just to get on the Play Store, just kind of didn't feel right to us. Luckily, this quote is hilarious because it's so true. If something can be written in JavaScript, you can bet that one day it will eventually be written in JavaScript. And that led us on to React Native, partly because we'd already been using React in our web applications, even in Magento stores, <clears throat> and partly because it was just getting so popular. It was on Hacker News every other day at the time. It promised to give us iOS and Android apps out of the box just from JavaScript code. So we were really excited about this. There'd be no need to like, hire anyone else, no need to learn any new languages and we still be able to deliver for this client. <coughs> we started to think, well, is this something that's going to be around in the future? Is this a big project? Is it worthwhile? Should we invest in it? And then I just picked off four of the best logos off their website, where you can see the scale and the size of companies who are adopting this technology. Uh, Airbnb, Skype, Tesla, you get the idea. So we were pretty confident that if we went down this route, it would be a good one. Now, obviously, in a 15-minute talk, I can't tell you about all the competitors to React Native, and that would be pretty boring anyway. I can just tell you why we chose React Native. We looked into it, and it's very actively um, developed by Facebook. <coughs> the open source stuff that's coming out of Facebook at the moment, I don't know if any of you follow that type of thing, but it's incredible. Every single month, there's a new release with bug fixes and features, and it's just great to watch and great to be a part of, even if it's hard to keep up to date. It uses modern tooling, so straight away, you can use the latest versions of JavaScript, and you get things like hot module reloading out of the box. If you've never seen that in action, it's literally save a file, hold a phone in your hand, that's that's, uh, that new file will be transmitted over a WebSocket, and you can see the change in your hand without the app even refreshing. Pretty incredible. We get to just write JavaScript, so this was awesome. The idea that we could deliver to this platform in the language that we're experienced in was great. This quote tends to be between 90 and 95 percent. The idea is that you write, sorry, the most of your most of the code that you write will work on iOS and on Android. The reason it's not 100 percent is that those platforms have got slight differences in the operating system. The users expect some things to be slightly different for lists and other things like that. But the idea that you can get on both platforms with 90 to 95% code reuse, we were pretty blown away by that. And it's also not a web view wrapper. 
So when most people think about JavaScript and native apps, they're thinking of those platforms that take a website, stick it in a frame, and then call that an app. React Native does not do that. Your business logic and the, most of your code is executed in JavaScript, but the user interface that it generates and the interactions are native to the host platform. And this is incredibly important because it makes it feel to the user like you basically wrote it in Swift or in Kotlin. <coughs> but it came with a big caveat and something that we, real, we realized early on is that this is not for beginners. Maybe for a simple to-do app, you can get your junior JavaScript devs on it, but really, it's tricky. I've got a short video here to explain or to show one of the things that, were quite that was quite complicated. Here you're gonna see me search for the term door, and this gives like 900 results. <clears throat> the problem with that is that the way Magento 2 APIs are structured, we had to make multiple requests to the back end and then squish them all back together on the front end. The reason we do that is that pagination is cheating. <laughs> it's great on the web and people expect it, but in native apps, we needed all 900 results up front so that we could do a really good filter, for example. And then the other problems were that the performance of rendering 900 items on the screen was just terrible. Our initial implementation of this, it would stick underneath your finger and it just felt really bad. So we had to implement things like windowing, so you only render things that can be seen on screen. We had to implement batching, so that you literally only render in, say, 20 or 30 items at a time. So that's just a, a short example of one, of one of the problems we faced. And it proves, or sort of, um, it shows you that this is not for beginners. So how did we go about it? Like, we're just a web agency doing Magento sites. How did we manage to solve this problem? I always advocate this style of quote, if that's the right thing to say. I heard it once and I repeat it all the time. Don't ever get married to a particular library or framework, or even a programming style. Instead, become an expert at the fundamentals. And it might sound obvious, but many people don't do this. You have to take this quote and apply it to your environment. So for me, as a JavaScript developer, this means that I do not want to call myself an Angular developer or a React developer. Instead, I want to become excellent at JavaScript. I want to learn about design patterns and architectures and how to solve really hard problems because those are the skill sets that you take with you to the next job or to the next crazy project that comes along. So when the new hot framework comes out next year, like it does in JavaScript, not everything stays around for 10 years like Magento does, you, you, you will have that base knowledge and you'll be able to just quickly switch to another framework. So I think this is the main reason why we were able to deliver this. So how did we do it? Anyone heard of this project called Redux? A few, great. Imagine having all of your application state in one global object. Sounds great, yeah? Now I'm sure most of you PHP devs don't think it's great. But let me tell you now that this turned out to be the way to scale the application. Every single piece of state is in one place. Now there can be multiple branches, but it's literally one giant object containing all your state. So how do you even work with that? In a sh short talk like this, I can only give a very brief overview, but essentially anyone who wants to modify the state has to dispatch an action, and it comes out of a view into what's called a dispatcher, and, if, and you, then you can register functions at certain parts of that state tree that can receive the action that you sent, and they can decide how to modify or return a new piece of state in place. Again, it's hard to describe in a short time, but it looks something like this. So think of your typical object-oriented style coding, where you have your classes, and they may have a tiny piece of encapsulated state. And when you, you know, think of the amount of times you're in a debugger, you've had to step through code trying to find where one variable was changed from zero to one, for example. We don't have those problems. That, that type of, that paradigm of programming does not exist in this entire app. Instead, if this was, if you think of a, the DOM structure of a website, we have exactly the same thing in the app. We have component structure. If this was deeply nested, like 50 levels deep, it would not have any of its own internal state. It would dispatch an action, and it would get picked up by a function like this. We call them reducers because they tend to follow this reduce function signature, where you have the previous and the incoming item. It can then switch on the type that you send, 
and then it can decide what to do with that slice of the state. In this case, we use concat so that we, we're returning a new array instead of modifying the original one. So the entire, every single piece of state mutation that happens in our app goes through this cycle. And yes, it's a lot of boilerplate, it's a lot of indirection in places, but it allows something incredible. You don't need to be able to see the details of what this is. You just, just know that on the left there is a log that you get by default of every single state mutation that happens in your entire application. Right there. You can see what caused it, and not only that, you can see how your state changed. <coughs> That's the main reason for using it. I've got to skip on to other things because of time. Side effects are the interesting parts of your program. Without side effects, we have nothing. A side effect is making an API request, or opening a camera on the phone, or even showing an alert window, because that's operating system level. If you don't get, a grips, if you don't get to grips with side effects, you're going to have trouble, especially on an app of this size. What we did is we adopted an architecture where all the side effect in code <coughs> lives at, right at the edges of the app. Meaning there's no concept of having to step through some nested code to find where something made an AJAX request or where something saved a file to disk, all side affecting behaviors have to be triggered by someone dispatching an action like this. And then right at the edge of the application, you'll have these functions registered that can receive a stream of actions. And you can filter <coughs> based on the type. And then you can do something like convert that into an AJAX request. You get composition out of the box. So you can say that if that AJAX request is taking three or four seconds, and the user tries to navigate to a different tab on the app, cancel the AJAX request because we don't care about it anymore. You can catch errors in the same place. This is the whole point, is that you, you have your side affecting code together with your error handling. And eventually, if it's successful, you can dispatch an action back into the store saying it was successful. So look how declarative this is. There's no variable assignments. There's nothing. If you ever need to debug this code, it's literally, this is not like pseudocode. That function there would be the top level of a file somewhere. Obviously, it will be exported. But this is how deep the code goes for all your side effects. It's a crazy architecture, and it might seem very odd to you, but it's extremely easy to debug. One thing that you get, almost a side effect of handling side effects like this, is that testing becomes a piece of cake. <coughs> Absolutely trivial. I've seen some Magento tests, by the way, where you have to spend 100 lines setting up and to do two lines of application test. I'm sure there's better ways to do that, but I've definitely seen things like that. In our case, because we have those simple functions and because we don't allow side affecting code to be nested anywhere, we could simply just make it one simple mock of an, of an AJAX request, configure our store to use that, dispatch the action, and then on the next line, we can assert that the store was updated in a way we expect. So this is how the entire app is structured it makes testing extremely easy. And that is just the side effect of the, uh, the architecture where all your state mutations are described via actions and all your side effects live on the outsides of your app. <coughs> on to a few of the other tools that we used. Talking about code style, formatting, and syntax is boring. Not only is it boring, it's a waste of everyone's time. So we. In JavaScript, I don't know what it's like in PHP, but in JavaScript, we've got loads of tools where you can just do something like dash dash fix, and it will turn that code into that code, and you never have to do another PR rejection because of it. If you ever spend your time writing a PR response because someone's formatted something incorrectly, you're wasting your time and their time. Instead, investigate or build the tools that are needed to automate this because it's a waste of time. Sorry, the consistency is great. <laughs> I, I encourage full consistency. I don't encourage spending time doing it um, manually. The last thing that I want to talk about is that we use static types. I know PHP, sorry, in PHP, static types are a little bit controversial. Some people love them, some people hate them. I can tell you now, static types are like massive mobile phones. If you've got a small mobile phone and you see someone with a massive one, you say, oh, I couldn't use that, like, I couldn't get on with that, it's too big, you know, I wouldn't ever get used to that. And I can guarantee if you use it for just one or two days, you'll never go back to a small phone ever again. When you have a full type system, we're not talking about the odd parameter hint like you get in PHP. We're talking a full type system here. When you start using this, you're never going to go back. 
Imagine, imagine being able to describe the shape of every, every API request. Here's a quick example. We just say that there's a type called user that has a name and an age property, and they're of type string and number. Then you can use that type to annotate functions. So here we're saying that name has to be called, sorry, the get user has to be called with one parameter name, has to be a string, and it returns an observable of type user. So here we have, we have generics here too, which makes it extremely powerful. <coughs> in practice, it looks like this. So it's not a runtime thing like in PHP. It's a static analysis tool that your IDE can use and you can build into your CI pipeline. Your code doesn't have to run to, to pass this. But it means that with no annotations in this area, you can just call that get user function. You have to pass a string. It has to be one argument. You can never pass another argument by mistake. You can't pass a number. Flow will enforce that the function is called correctly. But then when you subscribe here, because we returned an observable here, when you subscribe, it knows here that user is of user type, because we provided it here. So what it can do is it can verify that you're using this object correctly, and that you're not trying to access properties that don't exist, or that you've spelt them incorrectly, and you'll get that feedback as you're typing, not when someone's running the code in production. So we fell in love with this, and we just wish um, we don't have 100% coverage, um, we wish we did. So what we learned along the way and what, what I want to tell you. Don't become an expert in a single library or framework, including Magento. Be an expert at the fundamentals first. Magento is just something you're working with at the moment. <coughs> Choose tools that make debugging easier. Choosing Redux and architecting our app to have all the side effects outside of the main code is more work. There's more indirection. There's more actual characters to type. But when you've got a bug and you can see that linear history of every state mutation that happened, you're going to be glad that you went to the hassle of adopting an architecture like this. Use automation to fix and auto lint your code. Sorry, lint and auto fix your code. Don't spend time in PRs talking about formatting. Write tests at the highest level possible. I couldn't go into this much, but you know, when you're first learning about testing, you aim for 100% unit, unit test coverage. It's the wrong thing to do. Have a few, u few unit tests where you need to test some really complicated logic. Most of your tests should be integration tests. Get a grip on side effects. This is the biggest one. Don't let some nested class hierarchy make, write a file to disk. I don't know how you would architect it in PHP. I'm sure someone out there solved it. But we got a grip on side effects, and we were able to do some really complicated things because of it. I hope that was interesting. Um, Shane Osborne on Twitter, Shaky Shane on GitHub. I work at JH in Nottingham, and I'm an instructor on Egghead. Thank you. Do, uh, does anyone have a question? First opportunity. Oh, oh uh, we have oh, a question. For hello. James up here. Hi. Hi. Hello. This, this seems pretty cool. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's gone. Um, so I heard it said, as, as a matter of fact, I've, I think I've seen it said in the, in the Redux documentation itself that um, Redux is at its root very, very simple. Yep. And that you could technically, if you're using RxJS, you could re implement Redux's store in a few lines. Absolutely. So can you try to drill down to uh, what you use a combination of Redux and Rx for that that was the best fit for and, and how you pushed against the feeling of ah, too many dependencies. How did you make that decision? It was very, it was very simple actually because I have, I'm um, not an expert but I've given talks on RxJS in the past by the way so that's, that's my uh, area really but um, in terms of Redux we, we chose to use Redux ourselves instead of rewriting it because of the, um, the ecosystem around it. So that, that, those dev tools you saw there just work out of the box. When you want to do persistence on an app, for example, it's really important. So we, we, we stuck with Redux because of the ecosystem. Okay. And then we used Redux Observable, which is just a, basically a library that allows you to hook RxJS into right. the lifecycle of Redux. And that, that, was, that is essentially it. Yeah. They and play it, scale, very well. it scales to unbelievable uh, amounts of code. Hope that's helpful. Cool. Thanks a lot, Shane. That was uh, that was great. All right. Now